Hello, everybody. It's Stephen and Walter here for another episode of So Chatty, episode 80 for November the 4th, 2022. And if you were looking for our episode from last week, you're not going to find it. Sorry about that. But we had our new doors and windows installed. And, uh, well, we just didn't have time. It was a crazy week. And so we just didn't get around to, to doing an episode. So this is a double episode, um, I guess, whatever. So, and yes, the doors and windows are now in and they brought our storm doors today and installed those and they look very nice and it's all done and it's very, very nice. So now we can save our pennies for the next home renovation project because when you own a house, there's always something to do. What are you looking at? Yeah, just like it. I'm looking at one of our new windows. No, oh, admiring our new window, yeah. And if you haven't seen the episode yet of my vlog, I did a little video on there and showed... Uh, it, it all looks like the before and the after squirrel yeah i, uh, I guess jeez can't get good help so before we get into today's topic and we got a couple of topics that are not related to each other actually i suppose they are because they have something to do with quilting i guess or whatever and sewing but first of all what have i been working on well let me show you remember this this was the quilt that i did as more of an experiment it was from leftover half square triangles i put together and of course i call it my wonky christmas tree because eh, not all the points line up perfectly i could have taken the time to square those half square triangles so they'd all be exactly the same size but i didn't because I didn't want to. In fact, I didn't know what this was going to be. I was just sewing stuff together just as a mind clearer. But then I added the embroidered snowflakes and the uh, applique snowmen and gifts and stuff like that. And I discovered that, you, and probably you'll say, yes, of course you can do this. Why didn't you know that? Um, I wasn't going to, I was going to do an edge to edge design, but I was going to have it skip over using uh, one of the features on Quilt Path, my computerized software for their Lucy, skip over all of the snowflakes and the appliques. And by accident, I had erased something I had programmed in to do that on one of the rows. And well, it quilted right over top of them. But you can't see that it did. And, I, and it worked. And I kind of liked it. So I decided I would quilt right over top of the appliques. The snowmen were a little bit plain uh, in their like their whiteness. So I decided, hey, let it let it happen. It worked and it does work. So I don't recommend it uh, for a lot of quilts, but for this quilt, it, it worked out okay. So that one is done. And then if I can get my cursor up here. This one was uh, another palette cleanser. Uh, it's called Chasing Rainbows. It's a free pattern from, I think it might be either Moda or Riley Blake. I can't remember which. Um, actually, I saw this on So Chatty with Laura Koya, and but she she was suggesting instead of using yardage, you could use charm packs for it. She doesn't call her station So Chatty. Or not So Chatty. What did I say, So Chatty? Yeah, you did. Well, everything's So Chatty to me. I don't know. Alzheimer's. It's my age. I meant so very, so easy. very easy. That's it. Yeah, whatever. Um, anyways, I have all kinds of charm packs. So like I collect them, you know, kind of a thing. I don't know why. They're pretty. I buy them. Uh, so I grabbed a couple that were the same and uh did this. And it was a very easy one to do, and it's all quilted and everything like that. But it's not a huge quilt, it's a lap. Um but not bad. But I am thinking this one might be one that I could donate. I'm not sure about the size of it, uh, if it'll work in that. I have to check the dimensions for Project Linus. More about that. And then I did the Candy Cottage. This is an in the hoop applique uh, project. I've made them before. This was a new design this year. Uh, I've got several gingerbread like style houses that are done in this manner. Um, this one, I'm, I haven't decided whether it goes as a gift or I'm going to keep it. I have a feeling I'm going to keep it. Um, I'll know when I get out all my Christmas decorations because there's a lot of them. I have to have spots to put them on. And I notice I keep forgetting to trim off some stray threads that are on that. 
um, but I can see them there. But I like doing these kind of things. They're a lot of fun. They're time consuming, but they're fun. And now I'm in the let's make Christmas bag uh, mode because Walter hasn't got around to it yet. And our neighbors put in a request in about old oh, June or May. Yeah, I'm going to get the one. Yeah, I know. I've heard that before. Tomorrow, actually, I, I'm almost out of, well, I'm out of large pieces of uh, Christmas fabric. So tomorrow we got to make a trip over to Ultimate Sewing and I need to get a few meters. Because what I'm doing is, this is a quilted tote bag. I mean, very simple design. It is lined. But um, I put Christmas fabric, I layer it, sandwich it, put it on Lucy, do an edge-to-edge -edge design across the whole thing, and then use that as my fabric for the bags. Cut my bag pieces out of that. And uh, one, you don't really need stabilizer when you do that, because the bag will stand up on its own because of the, you know, there's two layers of fabric and a layer of batting in it. There is a lining. I did interface the lining with, don't ask me what I interfaced it with. It was something in my drawer that was scraps, but it was big enough. So I just, and it was a fusible. So I put it on, um, wasn't a very stiff one. And I haven't made a bag in a long time. So I had to consult YouTube on this and I got to use that new ruler, which on one of my previous episodes of the Idiot Quilter, you saw that's by Caroline Moore. Um, she has this special little template that helps you cut out, you know, the corners for squaring, making a boxed bottom on a bag. Works really dandy, except I found that I wasn't able to cut right. I had to use my scissors to finish the intersection cuts, you know, at the corner, because it's so thick that even that with my even a 60 millimeter um, rotary cutter, it didn't quite get up there in the corner, but not a big deal. If it had been just a single piece of fabric or even two pieces of fabric, it would work fine. But it does allow you to, you know, you don't have to mark it then because the way the ruler's designed, you just lay it down for whatever size you want because it's got various sizes. It works really well uh, with it. So I'm kind of glad that I bought that. I'll have to show it to you. I just cut the corner. Yeah, but box. this, the, yeah, and that's how this does it. But this, what is all you do is you put it down. It's like, like a right angle ruler. So you got, your inches up here and your inches down here and so if you want like this one is a two and a half inch so i i put it down until the two and a half inch marks on the edge of my bag and the other two and a half inch on this and go bing and it's got a little you just to use it. the corner of a regular room because this works better because it's got little slots at the end of it you know like you can only go so far with your rotary cutter and then you have to finish off with your scissors well, this goes slightly beyond, but it's marked oh, okay. in such a way so you don't cut into the bag further oh, than you okay. want to cut right. into it. Right. You poopa everything. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Modern invention. I like it. You don't have to do it. You do it your way. I'll, I'll do, do it, it my, my way. way. It's fine. You will anyways. It won't really matter. So, yeah, of course you will. Anyways, I think it's cute. What do you think? It looks very nice. It's cute. Yeah, I know. It's not a Wally bag. Yeah, but I don't see a Wally bag right yeah, now. Yeah, I know. Do you see a Wally you. bag? I don't see a Wally. Because you've been so busy finishing up your shirts. More to come about those in a second. And yeah, okay, that's all that. So that's what I've been up to. This is what Walters finally got my shirt done. Fresh off today. But if you'll notice something... We're wearing the same shirts. Except it's actually the blue. same. It's the it, same fabric. Same fabric, only it's this is the teal color. And that's uh that's not teal. That's blue. Yes, it, no, they have a blue one, but that's that's different color than that's this not one. teal. Yeah, this is sort of a, a what do you call it? A, that's a royal blue. No, it's not know. royal blue. It's not royal blue. It's sort of a well, it should be royal blue because the queen's wearing it. <laughs> like, I mean, that's blue. Yeah, well, that's a blue, too. I don't know. Well, whatever. Anyway. Fine. So. If you want to call it teal, you call it teal. Your shirt, you're wearing Yeah, it. actually, this fa that fabric actually came in a whole pile of different colors. That, that the store that we went, our ultimate sewing, only really had the two colors in stock. So I have recently found online that they come in all different kinds. I don't colors. suppose you know what this fabric's called. Mm, or who not anymore. It. No. So don't ask. We don't know. I can probably find the remnants of it somewhere upstairs, but yeah don't ask actually i don't think it's in print anymore so yeah okay that's our story and we're sticking to it because i bought it last year last summer yeah it's probably not anymore because they only do i heard this on a podcast the other day they only do 
they don't reprint fabrics usually unless it's one that has been very, very, very popular. They usually do one run of a printed fabric and when it's gone it's gone i heard that on uh what was i listening to podcast with sherry mcconnell and uh her daughter chelsea stanton um quilting life i think it's called um because they're designers for fabrics and things so that was interesting to know so very seldom do they reprint something unless it's now northcott probably does on some of theirs because they've got like a lot of their ones they're semi-solid yeah probably they read well those but they, they consider do. those blenders blenders, blenders i think they reprint because everybody likes blenders but like yeah. prints like this or whatever unless it is so popular you know it's just moving off the shelves and there's a demand for more but they don't bother with it i guess yeah it's not cost effective so like tula pink i mean adam sos talks about the rare ones and how much people are asking for them if they've got them like that because they're out of print you can't get them anymore and the tulip pink fanatics well maybe i shouldn't call them fanatics yeah they are they drink the kool-aid um you know they they'll spend a lot of money to collect fabric i can't see the point of collecting fabric why you do i don't that's a stash that's for future projects okay. there's Not a difference collecting fabric yeah right no, but these people collect fabric and don't yeah. get to, to make yeah, no, it into no, anything. I know. It's, they call it curating or something. I don't yeah, know. well, people do that all the time with different things. They, so people will buy dishes and never use them because they're too good. They're good dishes. You know. It's... <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. I mean, my mother never used her and look where she is now. Well, she doesn't have Well, it's like those dishes that I inherited from my sister after she passed away. Oh, well, we use them. Yeah, we use them, but she never. Oh. She they were she just had them on display. Of course, we do have a complete set of really nice china that we seldom use yeah. because we use your sisters. Yeah. <laughs> Only really special people get to eat off our other dishes or good dishes. Actually, the dishes that my sister had I like better, but well, you helped pick out. Parts. Yeah, I know, but I didn't. That one that my sister had didn't appeal to me, or didn't. It wasn't available. Okay, whatever. Well, no, I like that one. I like the one that we have. It's nice. It's very elegant. But the yeah, uh, yeah, I know. So anyway, we use. Well, it. I do prefer your sisters, <laughs> those two. So, anyways, I just hate to admit that. You just like it because of the name. Why? I think it's called Chip and Dale. No, it's not. I think it's called. Chip. I don't think it. I think the pattern's called Chippendales. Oh, are you talking about your sisters? Yeah. Oh, well, me, your sisters. Ours is called the Dante, I think. Yeah. And no. I think it's. Uh, yeah. And it's Royal Dalton. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think, not that that means anything these days, but whatever. It did at a point in time when we bought them. Yeah, I guess, but not anymore. So, okay, let's get off the dish thing because that's nearly what. <laughs> this, that wasn't a topic on this episode. So, um. Yeah, you're going to see a few more of Walter's shirts when we start talking about batiks, because that is the main topic of discussion today is batiks, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, craft and Chat. We had Craft and Chat this past week on Wednesday. Uh, there was a bunch of you there at it. Thank you for joining me. Um, we got lots of things done, had a good time, as we always do. So the next one is the first Wednesday in December, whatever that date is. So if you missed Craft and Chat, this month, you can pick it up next month. Now, some people at Craft and Chat asked me if I was still doing that, you know, come and sew with me kind of a thing. Yes, I just haven't had it activated in the last week and a half, well, two weeks, because of all the stuff that was going on here with the new windows and doors, and my sewing room was partially unsettled or upset uh, because, you know, some of the windows went down here. So, no, I didn't do it. But, yes, I'm going to continue doing it. Um, so, if you tried me and you didn't get in, it was because I wasn't on. And I must do a pop-up sew day sometime soon, too. Um, don't know. Might be going off to do a an in-person sew day uh, with the Walters sewing class. What? That's... Uh, well, you I think still... it's the second Saturday in uh, in November, but I'm not, not sure yet because I haven't heard from... Oh. That's not this Saturday. Actually, it may not be the second Saturday of November because Brendan went down to Mexico. Oh. 
And he had, didn't say anything. So it might be the third Saturday in November. I don't well, know. when did he go to Mexico? Um, just recently, and he's coming back on the 14th or something. So. Oh, well. Well, the 14th would be, well, that is after next weekend, which would be the second Saturday in November. Because the 11th is next Friday. So the 12th is a Saturday. If he's not come back the 14th, yeah. the, talk amongst yourselves while we figure this out. Um, so whatever. Yeah. So I don't know when he's planning it. I haven't seen anything yet. So yeah, well, whatever. We'll have to worry about that. Whatever. Well, if he doesn't have something, I'll have a pop up so day maybe. Uh -huh. Anyways, uh, moving on. So somebody, um, not somebody, Faith, Faith, um, let me find the email. Where is the email? Just got it today from her. Oh, yeah, here it is. Faith Malarkey Kepler. She um, sent me this. She says, working on a sweet pea Christmas tree today using metallic thread. Some. First question, what type of needle or needles do most people use if embroidering with metallic and regular embroidery thread? Well, metallic needles. Well, actually, I just use regular. I asked them at the store, and they said, oh, just use your regular needles. Well, I think the answer to this is whatever works. If you find that your, your thread is shredding, and metallic thread is very can be very tricky to embroider with, and we're talking here machine embroidery, not hand, um, it's fragile. It actually has metal in it. Uh, to make the, you know, the, it's like gold or silver, things like that. It has metallic strands in it and it breaks very easily. So if your tension is fairly high on your machine, it can stretch it and that'll pull it apart. What you can do is if you're doing that a lot, go up a size in a needle. Um, I, I get a, a needle, no, go down a size. Okay, here we go. No, no, the needle, the bigger the needle, the bigger the hole. Okay. Okay, right, yeah, right. Bigger the needle, the bigger the hole. So go up a size. So if you were using a, a 12, go to a 14. But you can get metallic needles. Needles, they say right on them. Uh, you know, they're made by Schmitz or whoever, everybody makes them. Um, they're supposed to have a little larger hole, which will create less friction and pull on your thread so it doesn't shred when it's going through and that's what makes it break um now mind you i used a regular needle last year when i did some embroidery of metal and it worked fine except i lowered the speed of my oh that's another thing too lower the speed of your embroidery machine like put it right down to the slowest speed uh when you're doing uh using metallic threads the other thing is and i think she said second i'm attaching a photo to make you chuckle the way i take my thread through the machine well actually i'm using two machines because my bernina 830 does not have a sideways spool pin so i string it from my other bernina 180. okay so what she's talking about and she sent me a picture of this as well so i'll just see if i can find the picture it's a little on the small side let me see. i wonder if i can blow it up Okay, it's a little grainy, but uh, you'll get the idea. So what she's doing is her embroidery machine is in the foreground. Her Bernina is in the back behind that, and it has a horizontal pin. Not all sewing machines have those, um, but she's put it on the horizontal because the other machine, I guess, doesn't have that. And she's running it across through. Yeah, it is kind of funny it through the eyes of the other machine so that um it won't break you can see very if you look at the picture really carefully you can see her thread is coming from that and then going up to well, her vertical to fan. me that looks like it sh it's not the thread should be actually pulling from the end of the spool not from the sideways part of the spool oh actually maybe that's not no that is her embroidery machine in the foreground but the thing is, when you're using metallic thread, you should put it on a horizontal, not on a vertical. And if you don't have a horizontal, 
um, you can get a little attachment, this little plastic arm that'll fit over one of the pins on your or, uh, on your vertical stool, spool, 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 spool. <laughs> I'm uh, thinking about your colonoscopy. Oh, wow, well, that was kind of shitty. But uh, up your, okay. okay. Let me back it up. All right. Horizontal, like what she's showing in her picture. Okay, it goes that way. You need to have your thread come off the end of your spool that way, in a horizontal way. It puts less strain on the thread, so less chance of it breaking. If you don't have a horizontal spool, you only have vertical ones, the ones that stand up, spool stands is what I'm talking about, okay? Um, then you can get this little bar, little plastic thing. It just fits, clips over top of one of the things, the vertical, there's a word for those. Spool so, holder. Vertical spool, spool. Yeah, that's probably it, spool holder, vertical spool holder, so that you can put your thread on it horizontally and away you go with that. However, I have used both vertical and horizontal spools for it. I have really noticed any difference on the thread that I was using. Well, it also depends on the brand of thread. And there's so many factors. Now, I did some, I used a variegated metallic thread on my embroidery machine uh, not too long ago. And I don't usually use it. And I had... No problem, but I went horizontal because I have a horizontal spool thing as well as the vertical ones on mine. And it worked. I think it broke a couple of times, but that was okay. It didn't cause me a major, major grief. So I don't know. Maybe some of you have advice for faith on this kind of thing. I mean, everybody... I think it depends a, a lot on the thread that you're using. Yeah, well, uh, how easily it breaks. Well, my metallic thread was uh, not Floriani. I think it was. I got some from Monfil. Yeah, I think the, it was Monfil that uh, I was using. The, and it's, uh, I can't tell you what the brand is. It was uh, just whatever brand they're selling. I want to say that it was Brother Thread, but I don't think no, I don't so. Think that so. stuff was that. Well, the... I think you have some Brother. I did, yeah, I can't remember what I used. Anyways, I didn't have too much, too many problems with it, but. It can give you a lot of headaches. So, yeah, like the time I've used it, I've had a couple of times where it, the thread broke, um, but most of the time it stitched out pretty good. So, of course it did. <laughs> but I had my, my machine at the lowest uh, lowest setting. Yes, yes, definitely put your machine at the lowest setting at the lowest speed. Uh, with that, yeah, mine's four hundred and four hundred twenty five stitches or something like that. 400 yeah because actually i run my embroidery machine at the slowest all the time now um because i set it at the lowest for something i was doing i think it was when i was doing some metallic stuff and i never i keep forgetting to put it back up but you want to know something i feel more confident running it at the slowest speed yes it's going to take you longer but speed kills um and i have found that when you're running at the top speed i think the top speed on our machines is 800 stitches per minute um that you can have problems with that that speed and if the if the thread for some reason breaks or gets caught under something and it will and you get a big bird's nest underneath well by the time you figure out that it's going to be like that it can wreak havoc on what you're doing and it never does it at the beginning it usually does it all oh, right in the middle of yeah. a piece or right when you're at the very end <laughs> yeah and it sucks the thread down widens it all around your bobbin and then you have to get out and a good tool is and you've probably seen them they are stitch rippers but they look like little scalpel knives and they have a hook on them that's how i get underneath my hoop because i can't even get the hoop out because it has bound grab the fabric and, and you, the you'll be lucky if the hoop doesn't pop oh yeah that's the other thing too and at the higher speed like you'll hear it you if you're in tune with your your machine and i sit by my machine because usually it will do it when you leave the room always always when you leave the room you'll have a problem with your embroidery machine it knows you're not there it's going to wreak havoc on you so i listen to it and i can start hearing it when going wait that's not right and i stop the machine and nine times out of ten when i hear that sound it is pulled down somehow it's got a little piece of the fabric and the stabilizer down the hole to the bobbin it's wrapped all these threads from the 
uh, top thread all around your bobbin, all inside. You usually have to take off your uh, foot plate. You have to get in there, clean it all out, get all the little bits out and the whole bit. And in the process of doing that and trying to release the, the hoop from the machine, if it hasn't already popped, uh, you might cut, actually cut a hole right there dead center and once you've done that you're screwed you can't you have to start from square one again you can't patch it or anything like that you know when you're doing embroidery so these little hook things i was talking about these seam rippers and i'm sure you've seen them um work really well for that because they're very flat and i can kind of slide them under there and kind of saw <laughs> away the threads so yeah and i'm not sure how we got onto that part of the topic but anyway so Anyways, Faith, since, thanks for showing us uh, your solution. It's definitely a creative way of looking at it. And yes, it does make me laugh. But if it works, fine, do it. <laughs> um, okay, so another thing that came through was from Dale Evans. wonder if she's related to Roy Rogers. Mm. You know, Dale Evans was named Roy Rogers' wife. Yeah. Anyways, they're dead. Um, she said, as a topic for future discussion, could we get some feedback and tips for working with batiks, please? I've never used them yet, and I'm curious about some of the pros and cons of using that material. Well, I've used I've been using batiks since day one of when I was quilting. Don't ask me why. I guess because they were pretty. And you've used lots of batiks, and you made shirts out of batiks and and other things too. I love batiks because I love the variety of colors and designs in them. And batiks just seem to go with everything. Um, when you're working on a quilt project and you're trying to match up your colors or that, you can pick almost anything in batiks. I don't know what it is. And it'll look great. It'll look great. So I've made a lot of quilts with batiks. And I really find it kind of surprising that people don't understand batiks or are afraid of batiks. Um, and there's nothing to be afraid of. But let's start with what are batiks, first of all, okay? Batiks is a style of fabric, a way of manufacturing it, okay? Um, it says here, this little definition I found on uh, Google, batiks are a type of fabric often used in quilt making. They're made by a resist process where the designer uses wax to prevent dye from penetrating some areas of the cloth, leaving those areas undyed. The process can be repeated many times to create complex designs using many colors. This process originated in Indonesia, and today most batik fabric is still made there. Batiks are made of both cotton and rayon uh, base cloth. Because they are very labor intensive to produce, batiks usually cost more than printed fabrics. So, I have put a link in the show notes today to a short little video on YouTube that I think it runs about seven minutes and it shows you the process of how they go about making batiks. And yes, batiks are a little bit more expensive, but I'm surprised after you see the video and how they make them, it is labor intensive. They have these miles and miles of basically white cotton fabric and they they have artists who will draw an outline, a design on the fabric, or they have something that is, someone called it a chakra. Um, it looks like a stamp. Uh, it's a metal stamp. And they will stamp into wax and dyes, and they know how to make the pattern repeat, because these are skilled craftspeople that know what they're doing they're probably being paid pennies for this too because it looks like their working conditions suck uh as well um that's probably why they're not made here in north america because nobody in north america would do this kind of labor mm -hmm. you know for pennies and that kind of thing so something to be taken into consideration when you're looking at batiks um but anyways they stamp them and then they go into different dye baths and they stamp some more and so the, they they scrape the wax off so if you ever get some batik and you run your fingernail across it you might feel a little bit of wax residue on it it didn't all come out now most manufacturers of the the wax is all out but it also makes the fabric stiffer and i think that's why a lot of people don't like batiks because they think it's too stiff to work with i prefer it 
Um, you don't need starch with them. I don't use a lot of starch anyways. Maybe I should, but I don't. But I hear these people who, um, a lot of the pre-washers uh, who wash their fabrics, then they go and they starch the bejesus out of the fabric um, before they even start making a quilt. In my way of thinking, unless it was a fabric that is really cheap, like really cheap fabric, I don't see the point. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to get hate mail. I know because there are people out there that are dedicated starchers and they're going to say, no, 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 no. You have to pre-wash and you have to starch. You have to starch or you won't get crisp and nice seams. Well, I do. I mean, now I do sometimes I'll give a little bit of acorn precision pressing solution, which is a starch substitute sometimes to some fabrics. Sometimes when I'm using certain fabrics, when I'm doing them, uh, freestanding applique. Do you starch anything when you do freestanding applique in your embroidery machine? No, I never used any of that. I do sometimes. Mm. I don't know. It depends on what I'm doing. What the Actually, are. I don't use starch, period. I don't either. Um, for a variety of reasons, but that's a whole show in itself, maybe. But batiks are very stiff. Now, price-wise, they're not that much more. Um, I think sure. Well, it depends if you're used to buying like seven dollar fabric and you go to the boutiques. Well, you like, can't get seven dollar fabric. No, I know that, country. but I'm just saying that uh, uh, the boutiques tend to be a little bit. Well, they run a couple okay. bucks more. I'll use Ultimate Sewing as an example. Shirley sells her general yardage at sixteen dollars a meter. Used to be fifteen, but you know mm -hmm. times have changed. That's still a really good price. Her boutiques run about 17 to 18 yeah. for a meter. So it's a dollar, two dollars more than the regular stuff. So I guess if you're buying a lot of it, it does add up a little bit. But, you know, it's kind of like going to buy gas. Everybody gets all upset because gas keeps going up. And when they go, oh, gas is going up tonight, two cents a liter. Well, if your car takes 40 liters of gas, that's, that's, that's a 80, 80 cents. cents more on a full tank. You know. And personally, if the lineup wraps around the block, I'm not standing in line if it no. wraps around the block. I'll probably spend 80 cents on my car idling yeah. before. I but go. My, my analogy here is that it with batiks the same. So if you're used to buying two meters of regular yardage at $16, so $32 for two meters, let's go for $2, so $4 well, more. Not only that, batiks, the, the batiks look a little bit different, right? And yeah. they have a little bit different uh, quality about them. And so you may just want to buy them because they just look a little different. They And they're very color fast mm -hmm. as well. And they don't fray. Okay. And a lot of them, for the most part, there is not a right or a wrong side to batiks. So, you know, if you're doing a fairly complex quilt where, you know, it's easy to get your fabric flipped around to the wrong side uh, when you're sewing it together, use batiks. They're great because they don't have a right or wrong side. Now, these are just a few from my stash. Mostly. That's not always true. But no, I mean, there are some exceptions to... You have that. to take a look at the batik that you're using. But most of the time... See, look, this one, for example... Let me see, get this out here. That should be one. Yeah, right. Okay. One of the ones that. Okay. I don't know if this is the right side. Maybe this is the right side. Can you see a difference? I can't see a difference. So there, and you can feel it. You can hear this. They feel a little different. They feel a little crisper. Crisper. Not thicker, crisper, but, you know, like, and that's why they're so nice to wear. And look, this is the raw edge all the way around this. Pr pretty much no th no fraying. There might be a little bit here, but there not much. There really a salvage, is there? On this one, no, but this was a fat quarter. Oh, okay. Or something. I think yeah, I think there is. Bigger. I'm not sure if there's a salvage on um, it. I don't think there's a salvage on here. We team. will just chat. Hang on. You got chairs. I've got some yardage here. Okay. 
There is sort of a salvage on this one, but it's not printed. So it's it's just like a little line. Now, does that have a right and a wrong side? No, this one looks pretty much nope, the same on the same, yeah. both sides. You know, it might be slightly different. That's it okay. Even if there is sort of a right side or wrong side, it is so close that if you got if piece, you made a mistake, no one would, would notice. notice. Nobody would know. Yeah. So that's another advantage to using batiks. Actually, Wait, this one actually can sort of tell the difference between the right and the wrong side. Well, not really. Well, it's pretty darn close. Yeah, well, because and then that I thought the, the circles were a little bit more faded, but then I found a spot in the front that no, that's just it, the pattern. It's just the pattern is that way. So actually, not really. And batiks wash really well, as uh, too, in a quilt. And you don't need to pre-wash batiks unless you're a pre-washer. And I don't know why you put yourself through that hell. Well, I pre-wash all my fabrics for shirts. So. Why? Um, only because, well, for, I don't know about batiks, but um, for these shirts for shrinkage, if oh. it, uh, you know, your buttons might go. Oh, okay. But not only that, I have uh, interfacing on the uh, button bends, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, the material on the outside shrinks, then they'll start to, they'll mm. go, um, what do you call it? Uh, they'll wrinkle up. Yeah. But as far as for quilt making, you don't really need to. And you don't have to worry about color bleed. I have never had a batik bleed, ever. Ever, ever, ever. Um, now somebody will come back in the comment and go, well, I bought some batik one time and it just bled everywhere. It just ruined my quilt. Well, you didn't buy batik. You bought some kind of cheap piece of crap. <laughs> don't buy it from Walmart. And I don't care. You can send me hate uh, messages about Walmart's fabric, but no, no, no. And besides, we can't really get fabric from Walmart here. Not like you can in the States. No. And even then, I've heard that it's kind of dying in the States for that, too. So, pros and the cons. Well, you've heard the pros. I love using batiks. What are the cons? Um, Price, maybe. A little bit more pricey, but it's um, not that way out. Um, I do find they uh, feel a little different if you're making it into a garment. Now, it's not a terrible thing. It's just a little bit stiffer. It may uh, wash out over time. But, well, let's see some examples of your shirts you've done with batiks. Okay, you have so, made shirt shirts with batiks. This isn't probably a really good example, but anyway, um, I'll do that one last. Um, this one, I I was trying to look for a fabric for my very first shirt, so I went into the store and somebody said, "Well, why? What about a batik?" So I this is actually my Hold very it, first it. shirt. It's a long sleeve shirt, and uh, it's a batik. Has this right. shirt been washed? It's been washed several. Okay, times, so. Yeah. There, there's a question too. It will soften if you're worried about that. Once you've washed it a couple yeah. of times, this one is actually soften. feels softer than when I originally made it. So if you're doing it for garments or you're doing it for quilts, and you know you, you want to make a baby quilt and you're concerned about softness, wash it. It'll it'll soften right up. Now, when I was making the shirt, because it was my very first shirt, um, <laughs> I I had uh, I had to really be careful to keep the pattern piece is straight as to which was the right side and which was the wrong side. And since they both look pretty much the same, I had to mark, make sure I marked which side was the right side and the wrong side because so that I didn't get my sides mixed up and stuff like that, my pieces mixed up, right? So that is one problem with well, the batik is that disadvantage. Um, if you need a specific piece to go a certain way, yeah. then you need to make sure that your sides are marked properly on it. Um, at the time I, I was making it, I got a little bit flustered with it because um, I uh, wasn't sure if I could tell which side was which. And so, I mean, I probably, in retrospect, could have just not cared which side was which, right? Which brings up a question that someone will probably ask is, so how do you know which side's the right and the wrong side? I don't know. You just look at it. One looks a little lighter than the other, then the lighter side is your wrong side. But like I said... But there are times where you just cannot tell. Yeah. It's even on this pattern on this shirt, it is not very 
uh, easy to tell which side is the right side and the wrong side. And quite frankly, I think I could have accidentally mixed them up. So, um, but who's going to know? No, I know. I mean, nobody's going to know. Um, this is the other shirt. It's a short sleeve shirt I made out of a boutique. And this fabric, you definitely cannot tell which side is which. But uh, um, it worked out fine. I like the I like the fact that it was a, a the pattern was more of a a modeled color, especially for making a shirt, instead of like a, a specific pattern that you get on um, on printed cotton. So I liked it that that there it was a modeled color in it, and I I think it leans that so these boutiques lean well for their patterns for doing shirts. Yeah, but there's another problem though when it comes to quilting with boutiques. There are many, many patterns in batiks, but they start to look all like the same because they're usually abstract. They're usually dots or, um, you know, this kind of thing, you know, printed leaves or flowery kind of things or swirls and circles and, and that kind of thing. So that may not appeal to you in all cases as well. But then who's to say you would do, you wouldn't just buy batiks. Yeah. Right? So then there's this one just feel sorry i i come back i'm coming <laughs> um this is actually a kind of a unique boutique that i bought for a unique boutique for steve's shirt and this one you can definitely tell which side's the right side and the wrong side yeah and why is that because what they've done when after they've created the boutique is that they put an added print of um of um paint or uh sparkle or whatever on the exterior yeah there's a little bit of shine of, in of, of this particular fabric and it's not on the reverse side the reverse side has is just mottled and it doesn't have that extra paint on it so i could easily tell which side was which on this shirt and this is kind of a unique type of batik for that um for for that because uh most boutiques both sides are the same but even on this this is a printed one and even on this one i could match the pattern on the pocket so it's uh it's kind of an interesting uh thing so if you are buying a boutique you might and you you're concerned about them uh or you want ones that have both sides that are pretty much the same you might want to just check to make sure both sides are the same. Now, what about the you should the other shirt, or is that this I is the, oh this is the one you're talking about? Yeah, this is the yeah, one, the unique batik. Yeah. So yeah, you, batiks can be, you know, they may not be pure batik in the way that they've been designed. Yeah. Now another question I know some people will ask is, well, can you mix batiks with regular cotton? Yes, you can. I've done it many times many times and there's no problem with it and do they shrink differently when you if you don't pre-wash i don't know i've never had a problem um with it um so yeah i like batiks uh they're they're fun they're pretty now one company i just saw rob Appel did a uh youtube video last week uh he went to see the men, the company Island Batiks, which is a major, major batik uh, company, and their batiks are all made in Indonesia. But they they source it out. They I think they have their company in Indonesia somewhere or whatever, and they talk about that on the video. But holy crap, do they have a lot to choose from, and they're beautiful. I didn't know. I've had Island Batiks before. But what we get around here in any of the stores we have, it's a very limited selection because they basically have hundreds of different designs and the way they package them makes them even like you just want them all uh, with it. So if you haven't seen that video, it's Rob Appel. And uh, just look, it was up a couple a week ago, I think. Just do a search on uh, YouTube, Rob Appel Batiques or Island Batiques. Yeah. And you'll find it. It's very, very interesting. I highly recommend yeah. that video. And uh, they come in a whole variety of different colors, mm -hmm. and uh, anywhere from more mild and and uh, subtle 
yeah, to uh, to very bold and bright. And I think that's what appeals to me because I like bold and bright colors. And I think that's really what uh, grabs me about batiks. So I don't know if that has, uh, um, let's see, other cons. We already said no fraying, crisper feel, why I like them. Wide range of colors and patterns that make it easy for matching. They will soften and washed, nice to quilt because stitches do not sink into the fabric. Yes, when you quilt on batik, on your long arm or your domestic, um, they it, it your stitches stay up on top. They don't sink down into the fabric uh, with them at, at the same. Now I'm not saying it's it's a drastic difference, but you know you know I I've sewn shirts up. with it. I haven't had any problems sewing them or anything like that. No, they work well. So, um, yeah, anything else you want to say about batiks from a point of view of a garment maker? No, I just, I, I, the way their patterns are, I think they, the batiks lean them, uh, they tend to be good for making a garment type yeah. of thing because of the patterns that they are. If you don't want it specific, um, a lot of the printed patterns are very specific when you're, uh, uh by getting uh using it for um using printed cotton like here you've got leaves on it and stuff like that but on um, batiks they tend to be a little bit more abstract than that so um i think it lends itself to garment making a little better yeah well the thing too is if you're afraid because one you might find you know you're investing a little bit more money into your fabric for that I strongly recommend that you buy yourself a charm pack or a strip pack of batiks because at least with island batiks, all of the fabrics that are in that collection that they have put together that all go with each other. So you don't have to worry about trying to, I know some people get um, color crazed, you know, like uh, they, or they have color panic. I don't know. I don't know which ones to use. I don't know what to use. To use. So buy a package of them and you know and and those are your colors and it, you could also use that as your guide for picking other yardage if you need yardage in not necessarily batiks but in other stuff too just pull from that the, the colors it'll work it'll work trust me i love them i love batiks okay so <coughs> that was about batiks now we're going to change completely from that topic and talk about something i'm thinking about getting more involved with if you saw Idiot Quilter this week, I talked about this already. And since I talked about it then, I've had a few people um, send me some things about it. And that's Project Linus. And just let me um, go up here to my other screen for a second and show you. Project Linus is international. Why can I never see that cursor? And... I'm talking here about Project Linus Canada, but there's Project Linus USA and, and other countries of the world too. It's international. And this is basically, put it up here. This is basically an organization that donates quilts to children, um, children who may have cancer, or I, I thought it was just cancer, but it's not. Uh, according to their About Us, they say there's 44 chapters across Canada with blanketeers, they call them. Sounds like musketeers. Um, providing much-loved blankets full of hugs to children going through a crisis in their lives. For young children who have lost a parent or sibling to a youth watching his home burn down, to teens diagnosed with cancer or other de de debilitating disease. Um, they uh, So I thought it was just for kids with cancer, but it's not. It, it extends beyond that, which actually that's fine by me that it does. And they will uh they tell you if you go to their websites um what recommended sizes the quilts are depending whether you're making one for an infant or you're making one for a teenager and they give you suggestions for patterns i think they even have uh free patterns somebody told me that they did um that's blankets that's blankets I, well they call them all blankets because they do quilts, but they also will take, like, if you just make a blanket as well. But here you have the sizes, you see, for each one. And that's why I said that one I showed earlier with the chevrons in it that I made from the batiks. Um, it really, it's a little, I think it works out to about 40 by 60. So it's a little small for a teen, but it would work for a tween. 
if I give it to that. I'm focusing, though, on doing it for teenagers because, you know, say what you will about teenagers, but I taught them for 31 years. And, yeah, they can be a handful. It's an awkward time in life. We all know that. We were all teenagers once. Um, but a lot of people forget about them because, you know, 16, 17-year-olds, people are starting to see them more as closer to being adults than to being kids. And so they neglect them in, in terms of giving them things like this. And I don't think that's good. So I contacted the lady who runs the chapter closest to me. And it's there isn't one where we live and there isn't one in the town. It's two towns over. And uh, I asked her, what needs do you have? Because I said, I'm thinking that I make larger quilts. So I'm thinking they'd be appropriate for teenagers. And she says, oh, yes, they need them for teenagers. In fact, she wrote back to me. Her name is Anne, Anne Carr. And she wrote, um, I can absolutely donate your quilts to teens as one of my contacts is a teen shelter here in Ajax, which is two towns over, 16, ages 16 to 24 years. Oh, okay. So you're into adults there. I tend to get smaller size blankets suitable for babies and children, so I'm very happy to make larger ones. And like I was saying, people make a lot of baby blankets. I have not made a ba ba baby blanket ever since I started quilting. Because yeah, I, you don't know any babies. I don't know anybody with any babies. And I don't want them sp spitting up on my quilt. But what I'm saying really here, as being a little facetious, is that... Um, when people think about donating quilts, they think about babies and toddlers and, you know, elementary school kids. They don't think about the older ones as much. So that's where I'm going to place my focus. Um, and then she just talked in here a little bit about how to get them to her, or dropping them off or things like that, which is not a big problem because she's in her area kind of a thing. So that's my plan because I've got all these quilts piling up, right? I don't give them to anybody because I've either given some to some people or other people don't appreciate them. In fact, yesterday, a friend of mine was over here and he mentioned that there was a woman at his work that had seen the quilt that I had given him and she really liked it. She'd like one too. And I said, tell her it'll be $500 minimum, depending on the size. And I don't do commissioned work. And he kind of looked at me like, and I said, no, I said, I'm not giving it to her. I don't know who this person is. I give quilts to people I know. I'm not giving them to complete strangers. And you might give a quilt to a charity, but a yeah, charity a charity's different. That. A charity is different. This woman's not charity. Yeah, I know. Okay. Now I don't know. I don't think I'll hear any more about that. And I said it starts at 500. So let her know that. And I said, fabric alone in most of my quilts. I said to him, you probably don't realize the quilt that I gave. This guy, this friend of mine, I said, that quilt has about $250 worth of fabric alone in it. It's a big quilt. And it was a fairly complicated quilt. Um, And he just kind of looked at me like, mm, yeah, no. Yeah, I know a lot of people don't th seem to think that, realize how much money uh, a quilt costs to make. Right? No. So, But um, we've had this discussion before. Yeah, we've know. talked about the value of quilts. So, yeah, I don't think I'm going to hear any more about that uh which is fine because i don't know this person and really and it's great for him to be given away your quilt. well you know we've had this problem before haven't we with like one of our relatives not so long ago kind of a deal i mean but at least that one was to a relative so that was okay but um you know well it's just it's not because they're being nasty or something it's just simply because they don't understand because they don't do it right but anyways, um, I'm looking at this because I need a mission. Because I make all these quilts. When I get them done, I take a picture of them, post it on Facebook, fold it up, and put it in the Lucy room. And then I have piles of them. They don't see the light of day. Seems like a bit of a waste, doesn't it? But I'm one of those kind of people, I, if I'm going to make something, I, I want to make something because I have a reason for making it. And so this gives me a reason. So that's going to be my project in the new year. I'm going to seriously, every time I make a quilt, think about it as a Project Linus quilt or what that and uh, go from there with it. Now, some speaking of that, some people sent me a few things about 
Project Linus because actually there's a lot of you that already are involved with Project Linus. So I'm finding out. Um, this one came from uh, what I want. Oh, I think this one came from an email from Mary Ann Kushner. And I've asked these people if I can read their emails here on the show. So they gave me their permission. So yeah, it's all above board. I'm not just putting stuff out there without asking people for their permission. And she wrote, I was watching your recent Idiot Quilter video and saw that you're interested in making quilts for teens for Project Linus. Great work. I couldn't suggest a better group. My son was 14 when we discovered that he had a brain tumor. It was a nightmare, as you can imagine. He went through brain surgery, 31 chemo treatments and radiation. During that time, we spent a lot of nights at the hospital. The bedding was not comfy, but when you were suffering so much, it didn't matter. Then one day, a nurse brought in a quilt that had been donated for a teen boy. Not sure if it was Project Linus, but I imagine it was, and gave it to Dan. He wrapped himself in it and fell asleep. It was a lovely moment. Here we are 13 years later, and Dan is 27-year-old man, in seminary studying for the priesthood and completely cancer-free. Um, she said she attached a picture, but I'm not going to share that with you. Um, thanks for your great heart. You will be blessed and a blessing. So, yeah. So there you have somebody who is saying there's benefit for people to receive quilts. I mean, I've known that, but this is from somebody who, you know, it's a personal experience. And that's why I want to share it. So that says I'm on the right track for, for this. And then somebody else wrote, uh, this is Carol Pettiford Jones. She wrote, I just watched your episode 191 and I almost jumped out of my skin when I heard you say you had decided to donate quilts to Project Linus. I have been donating them for a few years now. They mail me the labels and their logo and I sew them in the bottom of the quilt. I'm sending a couple of pictures of donated quilts and maybe one of your future shows you when you present a subscriber, you're welcome to use them and share this story. Looking forward to to hearing from you um so i do have carol's pictures and i just have to find them so here's a picture of one of the quilts that carol put together uh for project linus and you can see this one would be good for either a boy or a girl actually when i first saw this quilt my first uh thought was this would be a great quilt to go to a boy um because i think the colors in it are good and you know it's not flowery it's more of the stripes and things like that and then she has another one the pictures are kind of on the small side so i'm kind of blowing them up as i find them okay here's the other one i really like this one too Jeez, could this thing be more complicated? Okay, best I can get it. Anyways, uh, I like this one because it's got, it could be for a boy or a girl as well. Um, but really, they don't dictate. Project Linus, from what I found, don't dictate what the design is. But they do talk about something I found very interesting about donations. And I, I, don't, I don't know who would have thought of this. They said they want quilts that are made from new materials. Um, they don't want them to be used. They need to be washed. And if there's a smoker in your household or you have pets, make sure the quilt doesn't take on like pet hair or smoke smell and that kind of thing. They also say they suggest you don't use fabric softener when you wash them because of scents and stuff like that now they gave some examples of quilts that have been donated that they could not use uh people did give them ratty old quilts you know like the kind of thing you might find in a thrift store or in a dumpster like they were worn and repaired and i'm thinking why would people donate trash to something like that that's that's ridiculous. But obviously they've had a problem with that because they made sure that in their FAQ that they mentioned that. So I certainly wouldn't be doing that. No way. I mean, give a kid a dirty quilt. Yeah, sure. What? 
how to make them feel good about themselves. Here, kid, have this old beat up piece of crap. Yeah, I don't think so. So anyways, um, I appreciate uh, the people writing to me about Project uh, Linus. And um, I told the lady on Project Linus, I says, it may not happen until the new year. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my stash of quilts. Um, I'm going to sit down with Walter one day because I'll need a second pair of eyes. And I'm going to start organizing them into new piles. Quilts I want to give away. I want to give some quilts this Christmas to some relatives and things. So I want to go through and pick out the ones that we think would be uh, appropriate for that. And when I say relatives, I mean Walter's family. Um, my family already have a quilts uh, sort of a thing, and my sister doesn't want one. So go figure that. Um, but uh, my nephew and niece have one. But his nephew and his wife, uh, Walter's sister, I guess it's my brother and my, I don't know, my nephew and Mary, I'm not sure how you put that in. It's your nephew and his wife, who's actually now your, your niece by marriage. So I'm married to you. So they're actually basically by marriage, my nephew and my niece too. It gets complicated. Anyways, I gave them a quilt not too long ago. Um, I'm debating whether or not to give their two girls each a quilt. Uh, as well, which are our mm -hmm. great nieces. Um, my, yeah, my I don't know. I, I mentioned it to my niece at one point when I was giving them the other quilt about the two girls, and she kind of said mm, she wanted to hold off, but she thinks they're a little young uh, for it. I don't know. They're they're not that young anymore. Yeah, I don't know, but you don't know how their mother. Yeah, I know. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. I, I think you can hold off on those. And then I want to give one to our other niece, that Walter's niece. Uh, and I'm thinking of giving Freddie, her dog, a quilt as well. Quilt bed. You know that one? The ugly quilt? I think it'd make a perfect dog yeah. bed. And then there's uh, then his sister and brother-in-law. They've never got one of my quilts. And I was thinking, given each of them one, that would be because they watch a lot of television. And, you know, they're sitting there. It's nice, you know, to have a quilt to cuddle up in when you're sitting watching TV. I don't know. And his brother-in-law uh, does have a heart condition and and stuff like that. So, you know, his health isn't the absolute best in the world. It's not horrible, but it's not the absolute best. So I don't Plus know. Plus he's diabetic. Well, yeah. So and that kind of thing. So that would take care of some of the ones for family. I can't give any to my brother and his family because they live in BC and I'm not spent going to pay for plus that would be another thing too. I have a feeling my quilt would be poopod by his wife. I don't she know. She has a good friend that quilts as well. So Oh, does she? Yeah, Tammy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. So um that's a story for another day, not on here. Uh, anyway, so we'll see. And then I'm thinking maybe some other friends don't have any anymore, but, you know, a few of them. They'd be great guilt gifts, though. Yeah. <laughs> I have an evil mind sometimes. And then the other ones, you know, well, I'd save some of them for me, but uh, for us. But, uh, you know, maybe and then so, so which ones I could donate to Project Linus. So, you know, thin out the pile because really... I don't even know what I have. I have no idea. It couldn't tell you. And there's ones there I'm sure if I pull them all out. What, what, what when did I do this one? Oh, I forgot I did that one. I have another pile of quilts in the crawl space. They're the Christmas quilts. I have quite a few of those. So yeah, just when you thought and you were on top of it. No. So, anyways, I think Project Linus will be a good organization. I thought Quilts of Valor. Now, this is going to get me into trouble. I I understand Quilts of Valor um, for service people. They sacrificed a lot in the whole bit. But I have some views about the military, about war. And I don't want to get into it because I know it is it's a something that everybody has their feelings about. Um, 
also they were a lot more restrictive as to what they want uh for that kind of thing um and i just don't like being told you know i don't create that way so you know i i started out with good intentions of doing that kind of thing and it didn't get any further than good intentions so i'm not actually this project line that sounds like a really well good, uh charity it's more something that's up my alley because i was a teacher now yeah i make comments all the time about how i'd like to see kids run over by big bulldozers and things like that um but i am kind of joking i mean after all i was a teacher okay so and i taught teenagers so i kind of understand I well i did and that was just one of the side benefits of being a teacher but you know but anyways i i my that's closer to my my philosophy my my feelings my heart kind of a thing is teenagers um so yeah so i think you know i think when you're going to give something to a charity it has to be something that you believe in and it has to be something that fits your philosophy i don't know for lack of better words or your your motivation your motivation i guess yeah that kind of thing so anyways we'll see how that all turns out uh as i get going on okay so i think that brings us to the end of everything um do you have anything you want to say no of course you don't okay i guess that's it then all right so thanks for joining us today and i hope you all have a good week and we'll see you next week for another episode of so chatty and then everything else that i put up and Stephen, oh one thing Stephen and Walter live this Sunday could be very confusing on the timing. Yes, it's still going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. The thing is, we go, we fall back one hour. Our time changes here in the area we live in. And I don't know what's happening in your time zone. Some time zones don't change. Some do. So, yeah, we'll be 4 p.m our time but that may be different from what 4 p.m has been for you on your time so i don't know google it <laughs> see how it works because i don't even know how to figure it out but whatever so okay that's coming well if we go back an hour then 4 p.m was would have been an hour 5 p.m now yeah right so then if nobody else's time changed then it would be still 5 p.m for them yes but for others their time will change yeah i know and then it'll be 4 p.m and yeah and oh god it gets we should all be one big time zone <laughs> well anyway try and take account for that yeah if you if you can yeah <laughs> okay we may see you on Stephen and walter live or maybe not yeah. we don't know uh we may be totally in another our ontario time friends will help yeah us. ontario yeah in ontario we'll all be on the same page so okay all right have a good week everybody say goodbye walter goodbye walter <laughs>